Okay, um, I think we have one more video left and we are going to be done with studying the trial by jury. So it starts off um, just with kind of a, a wrap up and a, a reiteration of things that we've said. At the core of our common law are the jury, not only by tradition and the consensus of nature, but also by the authority of God, of God's word written. Moreover, jurors are judges and God's word sets the qualification for judges. Those esteemed of least authority within the local Christian assembly, says the apostle, are more fitting to judge disputes between its members. So the common man. So then we go a little further into this. And uh, one of the things that we talked about in the excellence of common law were historically the different courts that were in, um, I think it was Jerusalem. And so when you look at the Sanhedrin, the great Sanhedrin, and then you look at the small Sanhedrin, we talked about the bench of 12, the authorized bench, and then the unauthorized bench. So it was the unauthorized bench um, in that community. It was comparable in substance and role to our common law trial or pettit jury drawn from a small circle of those most knowing the parties in dispute. So it really was, um, if, if a problem arose within the community, that was the, the group that you wanted to hear your case. People that you rub shoulders with every day that, that knew you um, rather than some group that felt like they were elite that would look down and judge. And so the unauthorized bench was so called because unlike the small Sanhedrin, the bench of 12 and the authorized bench, it received not its authority from the great Sanhedrin, but from the parties in controversy and from themselves. So this aspect of common law has been in place for so long. When you look, you know, all the way back through the history and you see that it existed then. So Paul's phrase, the ones least esteemed, demands persons of no repute, um, as with the Hebrews' unauthorized bench, those chosen for the particular purpose of setting a dispute between parties, keeping the dispute from going before the Roman magistrates. The verse following says, Lightfoot makes clear that the apostle refers to this court of first resort of the Hebrews. So go here first to solve your problems. So to sum up, to decide disputes as they arise, the apostle admoni admonishes the Corinthians by drawing, the, by drawing and impaneling judges from the local assembly that fulfilled two requirements. Each one must be the least esteemed in the assembly, and they must be wise. The benefits of our common law jury follow use of such least esteemed for our jurymen. For example, in the, least, in the event of litigation, knowing that a jury of the those least esteemed will sit in judgment upon one's rights and property, but being ignorant of those, of who those judges will be, will motivate every member of the assembly to respect all other members at all times. Um, and I found that like hugely interesting because you want to every day do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. And you wanna treat people well and you want to um, be courteous, kind, uh, just be that best version of yourself. And sometimes we just aren't, sometimes we're discourteous, sometimes we're rude, sometimes we're self-centered, sometimes we're abrupt and maybe curt or whatever, you know, we all have our bad days. And so I can see, and I like the fact that they said that knowing that if you ever need to go in front of that assembly of people and you have to have that court, you know, hear a dispute, that you are motivated to treat every member of your assembly with respect. And I mean, you should anyway, right? But so I'm gonna pause just for a second, we'll move on. All right, so now we're going to be looking at the oath. So before all else, the juror is one having taken an oath. In fact, the Norman French singular juror denotes one having taken an oath. The plural jury signifies those having taken an oath and then impaneled together to determine facts and apply the law. The common law jury are those men, good and true, sworn to hear evidence and paneled to look into the facts of the case before them and to make findings according to truth and right. 
the word jury has to do with who is to determine the facts of the case at hand, the applicable law, and how it is to be applied, if at all. And we're just going to jump down a little bit. And the word of God forbids vain repetition of oaths. In addition, by limiting testimony to three witnesses to establish any particular fact. So this is one of the things that we saw in the excellence of common law when we were reading it is that you were limited to bringing in three witnesses that were going to testify to the same fact because they didn't want the jury to be overwhelmed with you bringing in 20 people, um, three was enough. So if you brought in, they were considered, I think it was compurgators. So um, there was a long history on it. So you could, you'd go back and watch you know, that whole series on the excellence of common law, but uh, it was just overwhelming to the juror for so many people to be brought in and say the same thing. And it was almost like you were trying to build some sort of public consensus on fact. And they're like, three's good. Three, that's it. And they cut it off. So scripture cuts off piling up unending oaths. Scripture limits witnesses to any particular fact to three and discourages creating illusions of popular consensus by overwhelming the jury with many identical testimonies. Keeping scripture's foregoing rules of evidence holds battle by trial in the balance of fair play. In short, it protects the due process rights of the parties. Each fact necessary to, to prove the wrong alleged requires two witnesses those who have personal knowledge of the truth or the falsity of the fact alleged. Not only is government barred from never convicting the accused upon his confession alone, but also discourages government from applying undue pressure or torture to force confession and discourages bribery because two witnesses are harder to bribe than one. Further, Jesus's exposition of God's standards forbids the use of compurgators. Um, do not forswear piling oath upon oath yourself but give to the lord your oath i am also saying to you you ought not swear generally jesus forbids piling up oaths because because unlimited repeating of an oath a vain repetition is vanity and there is no purpose jesus never forbids swearing indeed instances of righteous swearing abound in the old testament New Testament, and if sworn according to his standards, God allows the taking of oaths. So he's looking in Deuteronomy 6.13 and Isaiah 65.16. Everyone that swears by him, God, declares David, shall glory, Psalm 63.11. So to swear to a created thing demeans God's name because only he is entitled to receive the swearing of an oath and because to do so uses the oath in vain. Indeed, to swear an oath to anything less than God that is created, a created thing or a creature instead of the creator, is to swear for naught, emptiness, to no purpose, and is therefore vanity. In fact, to justify swearing by pointing out that one's swearing is without intent, meaning, or purpose, that is, one does not really mean what he is saying, is the very gist of the words, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The differences of opinion over the taking of oaths arises from Matthew 534. Widespread confusion concerning this verse turns upon the adverb bolos, meaning universally or generally, that is in a general manner. To translate olos with the sense swear not at all gives a false and irreconcilable understanding of scripture. To translate instead with the sense you ought not swear in a general manner hold truer to the idea of olos and is in keeping with the rest of scripture. The only other biblical occurrences of the adverb olos are 1 Corinthians 5.1 and 6.7. Both contexts demand the sense general manner, which does away with the confusion upon which some have insisted by the entire forbidding of oath-taking. Pause. Right. Because common law government is a government of laws and not of men, any oath claiming to bind a juror to obey the judge's instruction can never bind the juror to obey the judge's unlawful instructions. 
according to scripture, to swear an oath is to willfully entrust oneself into the hands of the person or thing to which one swears, enabling that person or thing to execute judgment against the oath taker for failure to carry out the vow. For a juror to entrust himself into the hand of any other person or thing besides the God that created heaven and earth is idolatry. For this reason, God demands that one's oath taking be to him and no other. Okay, so the next thing we're going to move on to is the juror's veto of the majority. To ensure the rightness of the laws as applied in particular cases, our common law has developed this jury tradition whereby 12 individuals drawn by a lot as a representative sample from the whole number of a locality have authority to veto majority-driven legislation as applied in particular cases. Moreover, authority of a lone juror justifies his exercise of this veto power, halting any majority within the jury bent on allowing government to act against defendant. Further, if such a lone juror is persuasive enough to convince 11 other jurors of his point of view, he will thwart criminal conviction of the accused. Although the verdict of our common law jury trumps democratic power, mob rule, the true jury never operates by democratic principle. It neither arises from a majority nor reaches its finding by a majority. Rather, selection of jurors is random. Its verdict requires unanimity. A lone juror's dissent overcomes all other jurors. So though courts have eroded the unanimity of the jury in non-criminal cases, a mere ma majority of the jury for conviction in criminal cases remains unconstitutional. In some common law jurisdictions, in non-criminal cases, the courts allow jury verdicts by a su super majority of jurors if all parties to the litigation agree to it. In all events, our common law jury have veto authority, in fact, over the power of the legislative majority. Thus, the traditional trial jury are an all or nothing panel. In the true common law jury, majorities have neither authority nor power. The jury are indispensable in limiting the majority will because it is impossible as a practical matter to convene the whole people of a locality or to ask the whole of a country to devote their time and attention to policing activities of government. Our common law jury has proven the most trusty and uncostly means of justice ever worked out. So to sum it up, in a common law country such as ours, the application of any law in individual instances stands or falls upon the consent of the jury. The power of the jury is to return its verdict contrary to majority driven standards, such as legislation, no more allows jurors to legislate than the president's veto of the acts of Congress allows him to legislate. It does mean, however, that the jury has the power to refuse application of the majority's will in any given case, if it believes such application is unjust. In such cases, the jury will instruct the majority to go no further. The last section is on the grand jury, and I'm just going to read you a bit. Mm. The grand jury are of ancient origin in England, but in 1933, Parliament discontinued its use. By contrast, Americans in recent decades have increased use of the grand jury. Federal trial courts are not to meddle with the grand jury, but are only to enforce grand jury subpoenas and guard the secrecy of grand jury proceedings. Nowadays, however, Congress is concerned that the true purpose of the grand jury to protect the people fr from aggression while investigating crime is now overthrown. The federal grand jury have become the primary sword of the prosecutor and are no longer a shield for the people. So it's being used the wrong way. Reading of federal grand jury transcripts reveals the grand jury's childish dependence upon prosecuting attorneys. They don't know their power. Congress's Hyde Commission concluded that the federal grand jury has become a rubber stamp for the United States attorney. With the grand jury, he could indict a ham sandwich. The Norman invaders of 1066, having acquired the French tongue, called our common law's grand jury, la grande inquest, 
because it inquired apart from government into crimes. Since earliest known times, the inhabitants of Britain impaneled the grand jury to help keep the peace at least once a year and often twice each twice each hundred. I don't know what that is. Um, and each county summoned a jury. Let's look at that up. I'm, that's going to bother me. Okay. Hmm, excellent. Hundred courts discussing the Anglo Saxon Dane hundred courts. Okay, okay, okay. So at least once a year and often twice each hundred, meaning their courts in each county, summoned a jury of 12 to look into any questionable actions of the folk of their countryside. Seven of the 12 could draw an indictment. However, with farm work ever pressing on the few men of the hundred, finding enough available men in each hundred from which to impanel 12 grand jurors proved difficult. Consequently, the early English began impaneling 24 men from the entire county to look into questionable behavior in their county. In time, these early Englishmen impaneled at least 13 men of each grand jury to make it harder for anyone to discover who voted for indictment in any given case and who did not. Indeed, the grand jurors' freedom from fear of payback, especially from the powerful, is necessary to ensure the rule of law applied. So if you go back and you look at um, the excellence of common law, when they talk about 100, it was on a piece of land, 100 families. So just in case you haven't um, read those, that is kind of how they um, organized long ago in Britain when they were setting up their, their shires. So in time, these early Englishmen impaneled at least, oh, sorry. So in addition, they impaneled four thanes, these were landowners, and a special jury to oversee the judges impaneling of the grand jury of 25 thanes, used to investigate a king, and if need be, indict him. They also used the four-man special jury of thanes to oversee the court's impaneling of the pettit jury to decide the king's trial. These same precautions applied to cases of investigation and trials of other freeholders of rights of land. Okay. Let's pause a second. So the next section, and this will be our last one, is what is an unlawful law? And we just have to say, um, where a juror is convinced that a legislature's claimed law is unlawful, his duty and oath demands that he disregard that counterfeit law and acquit the defendant, even if doing so is contrary to his oath to obey the judge's instructions. They've said so many times, you know, when the judge gives you instructions, you have to obey your conscience. <laughs> We've said it so many times. So, I mean, you have to do it. A supposed law can be unlawful by two ways, unlawful in every application or unlawful as applied. In a certain instance, that is wrong only in its application to the facts surrounding the person the government is prosecuting. Kind of like when we told the story about the fire. I mean, if you've got a guy just going around and breaking into houses, just because he's just breaking into houses, um, looking maybe an opportunity, crime of opportunity, stealing something. Yes, this is wrong. But if you are breaking into a house because um, you hear somebody in distress, you know, it's completely different. So um, unlawful as applied, you know, for that one. So for example, um, a supposed law commanding imprisonment of any person who reads the Bible, it's, it's unlawful in every application, you know, Whereas a law commanding imprisonment of any person that breaks, and you know, we, we just said this. Okay. So each juror must search his gathered sense or conscience respecting the matter at hand. That is evidence, jury instructions, affection, experience, knowledge, understanding, reason, gut feeling, intuition, arguments of fellow jurors, nature and scripture, and come to his own conclusions, never violating his own conscience, rejecting any application of law repugnant to common law sensibilities common sense. Okay, so we are done. Congratulations.